Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. My name is Felipe Filomeno. I am the Associate Director for the Center for Social Science Scholarship at UMBC, which coordinates our annual Social Sciences Forum Lecture Series. This is our fifth Social Sciences Forum Lecture of the semester, and I want to thank everyone in the Department of Geography and Environmental Systems for organizing this lecture with our center. A few housekeeping details. Attendees are muted with video off for this lecture, but we welcome your comments and questions for the speaker. Just put those into the Q&A box at any point for a speaker to address following the talk. This talk will be recorded and posted on the YouTube channel for, of the Center for Social Science Scholarship. You can find more information on our website, socialscience.umbc.edu. Check our programs. I'd also like to invite you to engage with us on social media. We are on Facebook and Twitter at UMBC SocSci and on Instagram at cs3.umbc. Thank you all again for being here. And I will now turn things over to John Peter, who is a human geography PhD candidate in the Department of Geography and Environmental Services at UMBC. He will have the pleasure of introducing our speaker to you. Thank you so much, Felipe. Uh, welcome again to everyone. Today, we have the distinct pleasure of welcoming Dr. Tracy Osborne to UMBC to give a lecture on the ongoing climate crisis and her playbook for climate justice. Dr. Osborne is an associate professor and endowed presidential chair in the management of complex systems department at UC Merced. She's also the founding director of the Center for Climate Justice, where she has worked to not only address the root causes of environmental change, but also the broad range of associated social, racial, and environmental injustices that come along with it. Dr. Osborne's work has been published in high impact geography, social science, and interdisciplinary journals, and she has been invited to share her research internationally in academic and non academic venues, such as the Conference of the Party's Climate Change Meetings. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tracy Osborne. Thank you so much, John. Thank you for that in introduction. And um, I also would like to thank Dylan Mahmoudi and the Department of Geography and Environmental Systems as well as the Center for Social Science Scholarship for this invitation. So I'd like to share some slides. Give me a moment here. Okay, um, take it you're seeing my slides at this point. So I'd, I'd just like to say, again, it's, it's an absolute pleasure for me to be here and um, to share with you what I think are some of the key elements and strategies for achieving climate justice. But before I go further, I'd like to acknowledge the Yukuts and Miwok indigenous peoples who first inhabited the land where UC Merced is located. However, I'm currently in Oakland, California, which is the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone people who I'd also like to recognize today. So we know that climate change is an urgent environmental crisis, the impacts of which are already being experienced across the globe. While climate change will affect everyone to some extent, directly or indirectly, the countries of the global south and low income communities and communities of color around the world. Um, oh, so I'm sorry, I think you're you might not be seeing my slides. Hold on one sec. Let me try that again. How about now? Perfect. perfect, thank you. Awesome, perfect. Okay, so, um, uh, yeah, so, so we know that, um, that climate change is an urgent environmental crisis, the impacts of which are already being experienced across the globe. While climate change will affect everyone to some extent, directly or indirectly, the countries of the global south and low income communities and communities of color around the world as we know, will be hit hardest by its impacts. And these are the people and places least responsible for the problem in the first place. Therefore, climate change is fundamentally a social justice issue. So in this talk, I discuss the urgency of the climate crisis, 
the inadequacy of current strategies and why I believe a climate justice approach is our best hope for solving the climate crisis. The playbook for climate justice advocates for a new paradigm for climate action that addresses the underlying drivers of climate change and aims to restore a healthy, more sustainable relationship between humans and nature for an ecologically resilient and socially just world. The playbook also attempts to lay out a set of concrete strategies aligned with climate justice. According to top scientists, in order to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, it's important to keep global temperatures well below 2 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels with an aim of 1.5 degrees, a 1.5 degree Celsius limit. And this is also the goal of the Paris Climate Agreement. In 2018, the IPCC, or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is an international scientific body, published a report on the impacts of climate change at 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, and beyond. And in the report, they also lay out strategies for meeting the goal under the Paris Agreement. Key findings from the report are the following. Um, one is to keep to, that keeping global temperatures be below the 1.5 degrees Celsius um, limit will require major and immediate action at an unprecedented scale. We have never before witnessed such widespread rapid changes to our climate and massive transformations will need to be made across energy, land, industrial and urban, as well as other systems um, and across technologies and geographies. Another one, one of the findings is that there's a significant difference between warming at 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius, as ecosystems are very sensitive to even slight warming. So, for example, at 2 degrees, according to the report, we would essentially lose all coral reefs, but at 1.5 degrees, we could save about 70% of them. Also, several hundred million human lives are at stake. And whole species are at risk of extinction, given the high levels of deforestation and habitat loss associated with climate change. Even at 1.5 degrees, um, even at the 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming, low income communities and vulnerable populations will experience impacts. These communities, particularly in the global south, are more vulnerable to climate change due to loss of livelihoods, food insecurity, population displacement health effects and other climate impacts. Importantly, the report provided key timelines for action. It concluded that if we continue business as usual, we will reach 1.5 degrees by the year 2030, and that's now less than 10 years away. Also, emissions must, must reach net zero by the year 2050. And the sooner emissions peak, the better the chance of keeping global temperatures below 1.5 degrees. The good news, if there, if there is any, is that keeping global temperatures below 1.5 is economically and technically feasible. It requires a massive investment in renewable energy and shifting our economies from its reliance on fossil fuels toward one based on renewable energy. It also requires protecting and restoring forests, as well as other forms of carbon re removal, both natural and technological. The bad news is that the IPCC report found that keeping global temperatures below 1.5 is politically unlikely, given the level of climate denial and inaction in one of the world's largest economies and, and carbon emitters, the US, as well as the weak international targets that, even if successful, would lead to warming as high as 3.5 degrees Celsius. And this is significantly higher than the 1.5 degree goal of the Paris Agreement. Therefore, climate change is a deeply political issue. So I'm going to show you this moving image of the carbon budget and how quickly we're, um, we're, we're getting to the 1.5 uh, degree um, limit. So the carbon budget is the amount of carbon that can be emitted into the atmosphere before reaching a certain threshold. And in this case, we're, the, those thresholds are 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius above in pre-industrial levels. And so at 12 o'clock, is both zero as well as um, you know as two degrees above the pre-industrial levels, and at about ten o'clock, we're that's one point five degrees, and this is going to start in um, around in the industrial around the industrial revolution. So I'm just going to play this for you, and you'll see how quickly we are moving toward one point five. And you're going to see a moment, particularly around the 1940s, 
where the speed increases. And this is where the industrial model of development, you know, started in, in, in Europe and in the US really gets picked up and and in some cases, you know, foisted upon countries of the developing of the developing world, just coming out of um, uh, cult colonialism. The political nature of climate change is also evident based on the inequity demonstrated by these maps. What these maps illustrate is that the countries most responsible for climate change are not the countries most vulnerable to its impacts. So the first map on the left demonstrates climate vulnerability. It shows the places that will be most severely impacted by climate change, including extreme weather, drought, and sea level rise. These are, the, are mostly countries of the global south. The second map on the right shows per capita greenhouse gas emissions by country. It provides a snapshot of the countries with the, with the highest current emissions. It's not a perfect proxy for climate responsibility because that would include historic emissions, which I'll show you shortly. But it does show the countries currently driving climate change. But whether you look at the, whether, whether you look at the figures for historical or current emissions, Countries of the global north are largely responsible for the emissions that cause climate change. So a better proxy for responsibility is historical, is historical cumulative greenhouse gas emissions. So this um, sort of video will show um, cumulative CO2 emissions since 1750. Okay, so of course um, the UK is is leading the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. So the US is in, in, in the second place here in terms of cumulative emissions, but is quickly increasing. Turn of the century. And around World War I, the US takes takes the first place. And largely remains in that that place. To the current moment, but you're also seeing some changes. In the positions of of other countries. The Soviet Union is, Union is quickly increasing. China is, is on the scene. Soviet Union is in second place, and the U.S. Is, continues to be number one. We see China rapidly increasing with the fall of the, yeah, with opening up of its economy, so China's quickly taking taking second second place. Okay, so despite the urgency of climate change. Conventional strategies and actions, particularly at the international level, have been weak and mostly voluntary. The Paris Agreement, for example, is not legally binding, which means there's no penalty or sanction for failing to meet these climate targets. Conventional climate strategies are largely based on market mechanisms and technological fixes over more equitable solutions that address root causes of climate change. Carbon markets can let polluters off the hook, by giving them options to buy their way out of retrofits to their facilities through emissions trading and carbon offsets. While the world has been holding climate meetings like the UN Conference of the Parties over the last 40 years, increasingly making bolder commitments, emissions have only increased as the graph on the left shows. So you'll see um, CO2 emissions from, um, fossil, fuel, from fossil fuels, um, again, from around the, uh, the, the, the um, following the industrial revolution to around the current moment. And we're, we see those emissions only increase. So I would argue that we need a different approach. We need a climate justice approach. Climate justice recognizes the disproportionate impacts of climate change on countries of the global south, low income communities and communities of color around the world. As we saw in the, in the earlier slide, the irony is that those who bear the greatest brunt of the impacts have contributed least to historical greenhouse gas emissions. Therefore, climate justice is a discourse and field that addresses the climate crisis as a social justice issue, as well as a social movement made up of activists, youth, 
BIPOC communities, and a growing number of people around the world who seek more systemic solutions to climate change. Treating it otherwise as a biophysical, economic, and technical issue alone will be inadequate for addressing the climate crisis as we've seen over decades. And frankly, we don't have, have any time to waste. But don't get me wrong, the biophysical, economic, and technical dimensions are important. But I would argue that justice and equity must be our North Star for solving the climate crisis. And this is because climate justice solutions address the root causes of climate change, not just the symptoms. And in doing so, simultaneously address a broad range of social, racial, and environmental injustices. Therefore, climate action must be based on a justice perspective. It's not just the ethical thing to do, it's our best hope for solving the climate crisis. So how do we get there and what are some of the key elements? Well, the playbook for climate justice lays out a set of concrete strategies for addressing climate change from an equity perspective in six key arenas. These arenas are the just transition, social, racial, and environmental justice, indigenous climate action, natural climate solutions, community resilience and adaptation, and climate education and engagement. These arenas of the playbook are deeply interconnected. Just Transitions is about transitioning fossil fuel-based economies to equitable, regenerative, renewable energy-based systems. And it's not just about technological change, but employment in renewable energy and other green sectors, as well as broader political economic transformations. Proposals for Just Transitions are being considered in diverse spaces, such as cities, suburban and peri-urban environments and rural areas around the world. The Green New Deal is an innovative proposal that tackles both climate change and inequality and is therefore very much aligned with climate justice. It involves massive decarbonization based on investments in renewable energy, energy efficiency, and sustainable land management. It aims to create millions of dignified, well-paying jobs and provides benefits to working class families and communities of color who have been impacted by systemic racism, economic exploitation, and environmental injustice. The Green New Deal is a policy framework and a social movement that operates across multiple scales in communities, cities, states, countries, and internationally with the ultimate goal of broader systemic change. The arena of social, racial, and environmental justice connects the dots between climate change and a range of intersecting issues that we don't often equate with climate change. For example, we know the principal cause of climate change is the extraction, production, and burning of fossil fuels. In California's Bay Area oil corridor, along the north coast of the East Bay, poor communities and communities of color are the most impacted by the presence of the petrochemical industry. Emissions from these facilities degrade air quality in the region, putting residents at higher risk of cancer, heart disease, respiratory problems like asthma, and other health impacts. In this region and in other areas, and, and, and um, in this region and, and in others across the state, people of color, especially African American, Latinx, and Native communities, are more likely to live near power plants and refineries, and therefore disproportionately affected and at greater risk of mortality from COVID 19, given these health preconditions. This example of environmental injustice and environmental racism is compounded by the underlying social conditions of unaffordable housing, a lack of job opportunities, poverty, and inadequate health care that place BIPOC communities at greater risk. These intersecting forms of social, racial, and environmental injustices are not accidental, but are strongly influenced by policy. Therefore, the deep structural changes requ required to address systemic racism and other social and environmental injustices are also critical for the long-term decarbonization of our economies. Indigenous climate action is another theme of the playbook that recognizes the significant role played by indigenous peoples in climate change mitigation and adaptation, including resistance to the types of extractive development that drive climate change. Indigenous peoples have been at the forefront of resistance to fossil fuel development, as we've seen in the cases of Standing Rock and the Keystone XL pipeline. Scholars have argued that in order to keep global temperatures below 1.5 degrees Celsius, compared to pre-industrial levels, over 80% of economically accessible fossil fuels must remain unburned and underground. 
While emphasizing water protection and the protection of all life, indigenous resistance to fossil fuel infrastructure has been a key strategy for keeping fossil fuels underground. In addition, indigenous land use practices have demonstrated significant benefits for climate change mitigation and adaptation. There's a growing body of scientific evidence also recognized in the new IPCC special report on climate change and land that shows the importance of formally recognizing and securing local community and indigenous people's land tenure for climate change mitigation. When indigenous peoples have recognized land tenure, they're more effective at protecting their land and deforestation rates are three to four times lower than similar land under state or private control. And this means that land under indigenous and local community management store more carbon. These communities account for approximately 300 billion metric tons of carbon in trees and soil, which is about 33 times the energy emissions from the, from the year 2017. Indigenous climate action, therefore, must be supported and is a key element of climate justice. The impacts of climate change are already being experienced, particularly by the most marginalized communities. Therefore, community resilience and adaptation are important climate actions. Resilience measures a community's capability of bouncing back from a shock or climate impact like a hurricane, drought, or flood. And adaptation means reducing the negative impacts of climate change that are already occurring and expected to increase. Low income um, countries and communities often have lower capacity to adapt and conventional models of economic development have been promoted as a strategy for increasing adaptive capacity. But these models are based on systems that led to the problem in the first place. Instead, from a justice and equity perspective, community resilience and climate adaptation would include models such as food sovereignty, common property forest management, and energy democracy. Natural climate solutions recognize the importance of centering forests and agricultural lands as critical ecosystems for equitable climate action. Natural climate solutions have often focused on tree planting alone, like the examples of planting millions of trees in monocultural plantations with drones. From a climate justice perspective, however, natural climate solutions include regenerative farming, agroforestry, permaculture, urban gardens, and forest restoration. The protection and restoration of tropical forests represents a particularly important arena for climate action. Forests are a significant source of carbon emissions when destroyed or degraded, and they're also important sinks that contain approximately 650 billion tons of carbon. Tropical forests are also important for biodiversity as well as the local as well as to local and indigenous communities who derive livelihood, cultural and sacred value from these ecosystems. Regenerative farming that's based on sustainable agricultural practices store more carbon in the soil. These practices, particularly in the hands of small and medium sized farmers and local communities represent examples of climate justice. Importantly, a climate justice approach considers not just how the land is managed, but who has access. It ensures marginalized communities have access to land as well as the benefits of that land to better support community resilience. Given the high levels of climate denial and misunderstanding about climate change in some of the countries most responsible for, for the problem, such as the US, education and engagement is desperately needed around this issue. Most of the education on climate change has focused on the science, technology, and economics. The type of education I'm referring to is not only climate science, but instead the ways that climate change is deeply interconnected to a range of other social, racial, and environmental justice issues that affect our lives in, in more direct ways. Therefore, education and engagement are critical areas for climate action. In particular, it's important to leverage higher education. Colleges and universities have provided important leadership on climate action, particularly in the areas of fossil fuel divestment and carbon neutrality goals. As youth are at the forefront of the climate justice movement, colleges and universities are key sites for justice-oriented climate action. And with a populace better educated on climate justice, we can build civic engagement to support candidates who recognize climate change as an urgent existential crisis 
will unite the country behind the science and take bold steps toward deep decarbonization, deep decarbonization from an equity perspective. This is the type of education, research, and engagement we will be carrying out as part of the Center for Climate Justice, a new University of California system-wide center recently launched on Earth Day to address climate change as a social justice and equity issue. And I'm honored to serve as the center's founding director. The aim of the Center for Climate Justice is to harness the power of the university to address climate change as an equity and social justice issue. The center's vision is a world where broad-based climate action is driven by science and a systems perspective with social and ecological justice at the forefront. We aim to center issues of equity in addressing climate change, working collaboratively with a broad ecosystem of climate justice actors, including researchers, educators, NGO staff, activists, policymakers, philanthropists, BIPOC and community leaders, youth movement leaders, and private sector actors who are committed to climate justice in California, across the US and beyond. Through innovative research, transformative education, and public engagement, we are committed to empowering the next generation of climate justice leaders. There are six key pillars of the center's work, and you'll recognize, um, as you'll recognize, as they're also the key elements of the playbook. So again, just transition, social, racial, and environmental justice, indigenous climate action, community resilience and adaptation, natural climate solutions, and education and engagement. And we have three key projects, one in the area of research, another in engagement, and the final project that we're, that we're working on over the next year, year to two years is one on education. So our, um, the, the first one on research is the Climate Justice Research and Action Agenda. So the re this research is, is oriented around a convergence research agenda that includes multiple ways of knowing from our partners in academia, climate justice organizations, BIPOC and rural communities, indigenous nations, philanthropists, state aid entities, and private sector actors committed to a regenerative economy. Convergence research, which is driven by a compelling problem and deep integration uh, across disciplines was identified as one of the 10 big ideas for uh, the National Science Foundation support. Our engagement project is the Climate Justice Science Shop, and the Science Shop intends to support the specific research needs of our partners interested in equity-based climate solutions by connecting them with students, faculty, and researchers committed to real-world impact. The Science Shop involves participatory action research, which is an approach that challenges traditional forms of research, often seen as hierarchical and extractive. Instead, it attempts to democratize data collection and choice of questions and analysis. By working collaboratively with non-academic partners in the co-production of knowledge, um, participatory research is distinguished from other approaches in that its goal is not only the study of as the study and analysis of the world, but it's also it has a, a, a very important goal to advance social justice goals. The education project involves the development of climate justice curriculum that builds on an existing University of California initiative called Bending the Curve, led by faculty at UC San Diego. Bending the Curve began in, in 2015 and focused mainly on the science, economics, and technology of climate change. We're committed to building on this work and uh, this work in, in particular is inspired by the work, the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. At the center, we plan to develop curriculum for students and the public specifically orient, oriented around climate justice. We propose the bold goal to educate and equip millions of climate justice change makers to bend the curve on climate change toward equity and social justice. We plan to build an online curriculum around climate justice for undergraduate students, as well as a massive open online course or a MOOC for the public. The lectures will be accompanied by a digital textbook and all materials will be translated into Spanish. Because we don't have a generation, we don't have 20 to 25 years to make these changes. We have nine years, according to the IPCC, to significantly bend the curve on climate change. So through the center, we plan to educate 
empower and catalyze millions of students as well as the public um, you know, uh, at the University of California, as well as other institutions, um, individuals globally to participate in the center's offerings and to go out into the world and bend the curve on climate change from a systems and equity perspective. So I will um, end it there and um, we definitely have significant time for questions, which would be great. So let me stop sharing screen. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Tracy. Um, again, so if, if you've got questions, please put them in the Q&A box um, and we can, uh, Dr. Don Beeler and I can um, read those questions out loud to, our, to everybody and go from there. Uh, Don, did you did you want to add anything? No, I think we just um, if folks put their questions in the Q and A box, I think um, Dr. Mamudi and I will um, will either kind of um, uh, collate those questions or just read out the ones that are there, um, and Dr. Osborne can answer those as we respond. So we have a first question from um, from David Lansing, um, and the question is: How do you think the Green New Deal compares to the agenda that you laid out? Yeah, thank you, David. Thank you for that question. So, you know, I, we lay out I, we, I I laid out six key arenas, and the first one is the just transition. So the green new, and that's about sort of the types of policy changes, um, sort of infrastructure changes, you know, sort of recognizing the important role for um, em employment and as well as sort of broader structural changes. And I think the green new deal is very much aligned with a, the just transition arena. Um, we actually, you know, just, as I mentioned, we just launched the center for climate justice on earth day and we had uh, one uh, as um, as, as uh, a participant in our fireside chat, Rihanna Gunn Wright, who is one of the architects of the Green New Deal, and um, we also had as, as on one of the panels um, uh, Mira Fasoon, who is a, a, a member of the Sunrise Movement, that who has also also been real advocates of the Green New Deal. So the Green New Deal as a framework, a policy framework, but also a social movement is very much aligned with the a, a just transition um, that that uh, that we lay out in in this uh, um, as part of this playbook. A great question. Uh, so, one other question uh, from Matt Fagan, the one and a half degree nine year framing of climate urgency has been criticized for creating a climate of doomism uh, since 2030 is very soon. Um, so, every 0.1 degree counts uh, up to and past one and a half degrees Celsius. Have you considered alternate ways of framing the urgency here or, or what is the kind of, how is that ur urgency crafted? Uh, or the care and the, and the urgency created? Yeah, well, I mean, I think like first and foremost, we start with the science. And the, the, according to the IPCC, if we, I mean, if we continue business as usual, we hit the 1.5 degrees um, by the year 2030. I mean, we can, you know, there, there, there are multiple ways of sort of thinking about, um, you know, that, that sort of that goal. You know, one can think of it as a type of doomsday, and oh, we're 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 in trouble. Like, let's just kind of you know go to bed and let's just forget about it. Or we can take it as an incredible challenge, and that's actually how I personally think about it. I think we need we we need that type of, you know, is it going to be easy? Definitely not. But I I think it could really galvanize, and it already has galvanized um, the youth. Um, so the Sunrise Movement uh, recognizes this. This you know sort of is 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 united around the science, and this is this is a um, 
I mean, I, I think there are multiple ways to read it, but for me, I really see it as an empowering goal. And I recognize it's definitely not, it, it's, it's, it's going to be an incredible challenge, but I think we, you know, we can't, that, that, I feel like that's what we've done. You know, I think, feel like that has been sort of the politics of climate change across various scales at the levels of states, at the levels of nations, even internationally. So for example, the Paris Agreement, as I mentioned, you know, if all countries were, were to meet their, their goals under the climate agreement, we're still looking at a world at 3.5 degrees and that is not helpful. And so I think we, we recognize the sort of the scale of the problem, the urgency of the issue, and we start thinking about, th th and that's why I think that climate justice is a really powerful framing because it allows us to recognize that climate change is not something out there. It's actually something that affects our, our daily lives. It's actually a quite like intimate sort of like issue. And, and, and that's why connecting the dots, which, have, which we do through a climate justice framework is so important. Um, so is it a, I mean, you, I don't read it that way personally. I mean, I, I recognize that it, it's, a, it's, it's a challenge. It's an incredible challenge. It's really the challenge of our lives. But um, I think I, I can't I can't think of a more sort of empowering goal than to sort of do what what we can and 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 you know sort of make the sort of the types of massive changes that are needed in order to uh, you know keep global temperatures below the 1.5 as best as we can because right now and what we've seen in the past we have not been we we've not been with operating with that level of urgency it's not like climate change is new it's not like it's new but now we have gotten to a point where it is that urgent and we've we've had the scientific community be really clear about that that urgency and i think if we haven't seen anything more diluted language galvanize us into action we need a, we need a different approach and i think this climate justice approach is exactly it so thanks for the question Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, one of them I'm going to seek a little clarification on before I read it out, but um, the next question comes from Ben Daniels. How much of the playbook strategy should be carried out by individuals versus government and legislation? What are the best things an individual can do to advance this initiative? Yeah, that's a, a, a great question, Ben. Um, yeah, I think that I would say that much of the sort of climate action has been framed in terms of individual actions. And while certainly there's an enormous ro role for for individuals, um, you know, it's just, you know, in, in terms of energy efficiency and as 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 much as as much as you know we we can um, and feel feel sort of aligned. What climate justice really sort of emphasizes are these sort of broader political, economic, and sort of policy changes, these larger systemic changes. And those have to operate at, at kind of at the policy level, at sort of the institutional level. So what can we do as individuals? Well, first of all, um, educate ourselves on these sort of deep interconnections between climate and other social and environmental issues. Um, I think also, um, you know, as, as as citizens who who care about some of these issues, making sure to sort of support like candidates who also sort of recognize the the urgency and are taking bold action around climate, um, and you know support the types of policies that are going to create the types of uh, broader um, systems change that like like a green new deal, like the, you know some some of the policies that we're seeing under with the, with the new under the new administration that that um, the Biden Harris administration that also speaks to uh, the importance of environmental justice along with climate action. So there's there's quite a bit of interest in the in the MOOC, both in um, that, that you mentioned, both in finding out more information or when it might start, or is this a recurring uh, MOOC or could you just talk a little bit about that and the role that the Center for Climate Justice is going to play with that? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. So the 
you know, we just launched last week. Um, so we are a very new entity. We're a very new center. Um, but that said, we are, you know, across the, the, the UC, there are have been very, um, there have been amazing initiatives, including bending the curve that I, I that I mentioned, as well as the um, environmental justice, um, climate justice hub out of UC um, Santa Barbara. Uh, again, the, the the bending the curve out of uh, out of UC San Diego. Um, you know, Berkeley has been doing some really really exciting work and has just uh, brought together, um, made made a number of hires around climate equity and environmental justice. So there's uh, some really important work already taking place and a long history of that work taking place across the, the UC. Um, in particular, the educational module or the educational project of the center really builds on this very successful model of um, called bending the curve. And that was led by Professor Ram Ramanathan, um, a climate scientist in at, out of UC San Diego. It involved curriculum uh, main, mainly focused on the climate science, the technology, and economics. There were also a couple of lectures on climate justice. So uh, and, and that's that curriculum is out there, it's available to, uh, online. It was taught by um by by UC faculty. It's online for, for um, undergrad students, but it was also turned into a MOOC, so that's also available. So we are using a similar model to be able to develop undergrad curriculum as well as a MOOC that's oriented around climate justice. So, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the idea is that, um, so, so about the MOOC, we're, it, it doesn't exist yet. Uh, you know, so while the bending the curve that, that was developed by UC San Diego, that does exist. Again, there are two um, lectures in there by, uh, by um, by uh, that 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 are have to do with climate justice, we are will be building the undergrad curriculum as well as the MOOC over this next year. So I invite you to you know pay attention to you know sort of look what we're doing. Like we've got a, our our website, centerclimatejustice.universityofcalifornia.edu. You can sort of follow some of some of the work that we're doing. But this year is really dedicated to really like like you know all of these programs. Um, but the the educational piece is definitely uh, uh, critically important, and, and it makes sense given it's a, it's a university. We have another question about the climate just the Center for Climate Justice specifically. Um, um, Michael Fenning is interested in asking what um, how the progress of the center toward its objectives will be measured like how what are the, are the objectives that su um, support the broad goals and how will the progress toward those goals be measured yeah okay um how will how will the, the the those goals be measured well we have as i mentioned we've got three main projects um you know we've got our sort of and and i would say that a really key part of this work is to support and help further develop an already existing um, ecosystem around climate justice. So obviously, you know, we are happen to sit within a university space, but mo the, the some of the, the actors have been most active in this work have been non you know folks outside of the outside of the university. So again, these are uh, you know organizations. These are activists. Um, you know, policymakers, um, youth organizations, and so there's a, a broad ecosystem that already exists around uh, around climate justice. So I think one of the measures of the success is how well we can um, sort of collaborate, work with, and collaborate uh, with 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 some of these actors. And so that, that's a, that's part part of the launch was to really to to start establishing some of those relationships. We really see this as sort of long term relationship. So. I think one of our goals will be um, to really sort of make sure that we are um, working collaboratively with our non-academic partners. Uh, you know, we we all and that's also that also feeds into the engagement piece of the work. I think that's also going to feed feed into the educational piece of the work. One of the the sort of the goals that we've identified is, um, you know, 
supporting and generating, you know, millions of climate justice uh, um, uh, um, change makers, you know, like lead leaders. So I think that will be a very sort of clear goal. Just, you know, how many students and, you know, young people really across the, you know, across, I mean, you know, we want to translate this into, into Spanish. So we really see a sort of even broader use of some of these tools. Um, as well as the MOOC. So I, I would say that a, a one measure would be uh, sort of how many people we're, we're reaching with some of the educational uh, materials. And maybe I'll also say that, um, yeah, I would say those are the two. Those are the two. I would say it's, it's sort of like the type of collaboration, meaningful collaboration with our non-academic partners and really um, how many people we're meeting, we're, 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 um, we're reaching. And I, and obviously, I mean, we're, we are paying attention to sort of how, you know, sort of overall um, emissions. I mean, ultimately we're looking at sort of emissions and sort of, and, and, and climate justice goals. We're also collaborating with policymakers in cities um, where we've got relationships with, um, uh, with various actors who are um, committed to the types of, of um, strategies that, we, that have been outlined in the playbook. So I would say, you know, just also look, we're really interested in those emissions coming down in an equitable way. Um, exactly how we measure all of those components, then we're not we're not quite there yet, but definitely we're open to su suggestions. So I wanted to, to try to combine a, a couple of questions here. Um, and one of them is based off of uh, one of the things that you said you, you are focusing on the underlying drivers and the systemic issues. And, and what you said was that technical and market solutions tend to fail. Uh, and so I was hoping that you could talk a little bit about um, uh, Biden's current plan and Biden leaving out carbon fees and dividends from that plan. And then, and then kind of a, as a follow-up, kind of going at a broader scale, broader scope, can, what, what, what is the role, can we fix capitalism here or is this, can we think about alternate systems that might promote change, more equitable change? So, um, yeah, that's a, it's a, it's a great question. Um, so maybe let me share a little bit about uh, some of the work that I've done, um, some of my research on climate change mitigation in tropical forests. So um, while certainly, I would say that my work has always had a, a sort of a, a, a justice dimension, an equity and justice dimension. Um, I, I think that there's some really important lessons that can help uh, that can help me, um, uh, you know, uh, explain the sort of like what are some of the, the ways in which uh, carbon markets can can fail, um, and also this type of like technological approach. So. My, I, I conducted my um, my re research in southern Mexico in in Chiapas uh, around sort of climate change mitigation in tropical forests, and it was based on on carbon markets, on voluntary carbon markets. Um, at the time, you know, a, you know this this program um, was started in the region around 1995 between 1995 and really started taking off in like 1997. And as you remember, NAFTA 1994 had significant impacts um, for small farmers in, in Mexico. And Chiapas is, is one of the states with one of the largest percentage of indigenous, um, uh, indigenous um, smallholders. So these communities were significantly impacted by, by NAFTA. While they were producing corn, you know, and 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 other uh, food mainly for subsistence. They were also selling it on the local market, but they could not compete with the, you know, sort of, uh, you know, very low costs and like subsidized co um, costs of of um, of corn coming out of out of the United States, and were were looking for alternatives, and so ended up sort of uh, participating in the carbon market. The the carbon market is is very complicated because it involves um, all you know all greenhouse gas emissions based on carbon equivalents. So the the whole idea, the whole sort of logic of using a carbon market is how can we solve this problem 
with it with, with in in with with lowest cost, you know, at, at, in a cost efficient manner. And there's a, also a, a, a set of ideas, a kind of a, um, a really a myth that climate change mitigation in tropical forests is actually inexpensive. And it's actually not to do it properly. It's actually quite it can be quite costly. But there's sort of this myth that it's low low cost, and in doing so, it tends to um, target low you know subsistence farmers, far, you know small farmers. As, po as opposed to the real drivers of deforestation in the region. So cattle, large scale cattle ranching and um, palm oil was not touched, but those activities were allowed to continue while the small farmers and, and indigenous um, communities, those were the types of, of activities that were targeted for, um, for engagement in the carbon market, which meant um, limiting some of their own production in those, in those areas uh, or the way that their traditional land uses and, and, and instead planting um, carbon sequestering trees. There is often monoculture in somewhat of a, of a plant, plant in, some, in some, some cases, yeah, very few, um, very little diversity and it, there were a lot of significant problems. Um, but I think what also we learned from that, what I also learned from that, that project was the importance of indigenous land use practices that actually generated significant carbon um, and it was these types of markets that was that was that markets that were displacing the indigenous land use practices that actually were were supporting really truly supporting climate change mitigation. So markets have you know can especially within this existing with within a, this existing sort of um, you know growth oriented capitalist system can create these unintended effects that. Um, are not helpful with with regards to uh, uh, with regards to climate change, and we've seen a lot of uh, similar issues of loss of access to land um, through other uh, through 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 uh, you know there's a, there's a lot of um, sort of research done a lot of by, by geographers that looks at some of the the issues of um, dispossession, uh, loss of land access, and so all of various problems associated with the commodification of carbon. So. Um, and so we, you know, and so the that, and so in a lot of ways, tree planting is a sort of technological fix. There's so much focus on, you know, carbon and it's, it's disaggregated from a, a broader set of social and cultural and environmental values that it becomes a technological fix and tree planting becomes the technological fix that is promoted that is um, that is is funded so much so that we see um, you know even on its own terms the project fails to really meet the the uh, its goals of of climate change mitigation and again it sort of um, it prevents the 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 real mitigation and and sustainable practices that had been taking place beforehand. Thank you. So I have a question that came in uh, right before you started talking about um, the example from Mexico. So maybe that example um, actually answers this question, um, but I'll, I'll just um, kind of sum it up and uh, maybe you could say a little bit more. Um, Simon, uh, Simon Winter is asking about um, strategies for reducing greenhouse gas emissions that are not socially equitable. And I think you just, um, what you just described was an example of that. Um, I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on the social inequities entailed in, um, in existing greenhouse gas emissions reductions um, strategies that you've seen. Yeah. Um, so I would say there's a number of key concerns with traditional strategy. So traditional strategies for, I mean, I, my, my, my area is more in the area of like of climate change mitigation and tropical forests. So we know that forests are an important um, area, especially tropical forests for climate change, cl climate change mitigation. Uh, one of the main strategies is red plus, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. It includes sustainable forest management, conservation, and the enhancement of, of carbon stocks. Um, you know, while much of the funding currently is 
public funding, so from bilateral institutions, country governments, a lot of that funding is for what's called red readiness. So it basically is preparing those countries, pre preparing the sort of countries and 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 um, regions for uh, results based payments, essentially for a type of carbon market. So some of the main problems that I've seen with red and climate change mitigation in, in forests is again this sort of market logic and this sort of uh this this sort of myth that that climate change mitigation in for in, in forests is is low cost and therefore it fails to reduce the real drivers of climate change instead it tends to target like as i mentioned the the lo the small communities uh, you know, indigenous communities that are not really responsible for, they're not really sort of driving deforestation. Um, so there's, there's also a, a set of what are called um, environmental integrity issues that have been, that are, are sort of well known with um, red and carbon forestry projects. And these are that, you know, oftentimes these projects are not necessarily um, additional, like these, uh, a plantation might have been you know, uh, planned in, you know, for long periods of time, but because now there's carbon funding, it's now sort of packaged as a, a carbon project. There's issues of leakage. Um, you know, leakage is when, you know, a, a forest might be protected in one area of, of, a, um, of even, even of a country, and there's funding to support that, but because of market needs, because of just also sort of subsistence needs in some cases, that, that, uh, sort of, you know, um, deforestation just moves to another area. So there's, there's, there's leakage. So in the end, we don't actually have, sort of, you know, um, the, that, that type of um, real protection. And then there's permanence. Forests, it, it's, you know, when you have a, a facility, you know, a refinery in California, um, you know, buying carbon credits from forestry in the Amazon, for example, and that oil, that sort of those fossil fuels are burned um that that in a carbon market that the fossil fuel carbon is equated to biotic carbon to, to forest carbon those are very different pools of carbon because look at what we've seen in the amazon the amazon has been on fire you know in in the particularly over the last decade but we remember like last year though the amazon has been burning and so you might have a project in the amazon that has gotten carbon credits you know a a, a fossil fuel company has bought those carbon credits and that emission, those emissions are already in, in the atmosphere. But we can also see that uh, the, the, the forest, those forest um, carbon that had been stored as, as a way to offset are, has now been released into the atmosphere. So there are the, these types of like kind of environmental integrity issues. There's the type of issues that I've mentioned around the, the commodification of, of carbon and the ways in which it fails to ad address the real drivers and also the ways that it targets uh, communities, like small communities, indigenous communities who are, who are not the main drivers. And in doing so, especially with, um, you know, land that's based on common property management and indigenous land use practices, um, you know, some, some of those, some of them, a lot of them, uh, it, it, it can, um, you know, it can replace those types of activities that actually have been essential and really critical for protecting forests over the long term. Thank you so much. That, that was phenomenal. I have a, one more question. I want to, want to go back to uh, Michael Fanning's question, uh, who was asking about uh, measures of success. Uh, and I think what he was getting at was with the general playbook in general, how might we okay. look back and see uh, that the, the, the playbook has been successful or making an impact either in the community or in the, the broader world. Yeah, no. Um, I mean, I think ultimately we want to make, we, we want, to what extent do we see sort of um, various uh, sort of um, jurisdictions, I mean, communities, like various jurisdictions of various scales that are paying attention to these elements. It's not like anyone has to sort of point to the playbook. Um, you know, this is just a, a way to sort of frame what are some of the key areas. And there may be areas that are, are missing from this. This is sort of a work in progress. Um, but I think 
by paying attention to all of these elements, are we seeing reductions in our overall emissions? Are we seeing a sort of a transition of our economies increasingly toward uh, you know, um, you know, re renewable energy? Are we seeing sort of attention to sort of employment? Are we seeing attention to the marginalized and, and vulnerable communities that have been most marginalized and, and, and are vulnerable to the climate change impacts? Are we also seeing like Justice 40, which is a, um, a proposal uh, coming out of the current, current administration to that 40% of the um, climate finance would support marginalized communities. And so, if we see that some of these these elements are being there, there there's there's attention being paid paid to to these various elements and we're also seeing um a, a reduction a, an overall sort of shift i mean these reductions are not are certainly not going to happen over, overnight and this is like an aspiration really this is an aspiration um but if we see that there's sort of greater discussion and the emissions um, overall, uh, you know, it's not going to happen overnight, but are eventually starting to go down. And also, because I think what we really want to, we, 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 I think what why this is important is because there are a lot of different ways to reach, um, you know, uh, carbon neutrality or reduce emissions. You know, we could use geoengineering and get there. And the, even though there's a lot of there's there, it, it's it's a, a these are new technologies, and there are it's very experimental that's that could be that might be one way of getting there you know another way might be let's like really sort of uh utilize even more sort of like um carbon markets and and uh sort of have that be the um the drive or the the, the what what's prioritized in um or the, the main strategy or mechanism for for reaching uh uh um climate change mitigation so or, or, or based on, on, on other types of technologies. But I think what's really important here is that a reminder that of the, of the, a reminder, a constant reminder of the equity dimensions, because take um, natural climate solutions. There's a lot of investment. There's a lot of discussion and, and investment um, being sought for Things like the bond challenge, which is the, the bond challenge, uh, 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 an international um, proposal to protect 350 million hectares of a forest of tropical forests um, uh, by, you know, by 2030. There's a lot of different ways of, of, of doing that. And, and a lot of those based on a lot of the scholarship, a lot of the. The um, it, they've, it's been based oftentimes on tree planting. So we hear a lot about tree planting and that can just be nothing more than, you know, sort of monocultural plantations. So while there are obviously climate benefits to that, to, to those, to those, you know, we're, what we're arguing is that we need a different model and we need a model that's going to actually sort of shift some of those underlying frameworks that that led to climate change, as well as a, a, the range of other social, you know, racial and environmental um, crises that we're facing. Um, so I, I think that it's a reminder that justice and equity really sort of ought, ought to lead on um, on climate action because we've we've we have a a much longer history where the technology and the markets, those have led. And they have not led to the types of outcomes that we would like to see. So we're gonna, I, I think if we, but given the, the urgency, like we really um, ought to consider a, a, a strategy that's based on, that, that's based on equity and justice. Thank you, Dr. Osborne. Um, so I have a question from um, Susan McCulley, um, calling herself a non-social science interloper, but I don't think we have any interloper here. here. I think we're all um, together in this struggle. Um, but bringing up the, uh, the issue of narrative, which I, I think is a great idea. Um, and uh, Susan asks, what do you see, um, Sorry, the chat jumps around a bit. Um, what do you see as the value of changing the narratives in popular culture 
so that more collective action versus individual heroic actions are seen as the site of meaningful action. Um, and this question is really getting at the, um, the urgency of education and how we educate and promote change urgently. So maybe speaking to that component of um, the, the um, climate justice playbook that's about education and engagement. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great, great question. So, you know, I think what we want, what we're emphasizing or sort of what, um, you know, the, the Center for Climate Justice around sort of this, the, our, 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 um, uh, the pillar or the, the sort of the, the arena around education and engagement, um, but also sort of the actual work that we're doing as part of the center. It's, as I mentioned, it's based on what's called convergence research. So convergence research, it's more than interdisciplinary. It's even beyond transdisciplinary because it really brings the knowledge and the wisdom of really the sort of this, this ecosystem, which are made up of a, 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 a diverse and inter, interdisciplinary group of, of academics um, with our non-academic partners from uh, community organizations, policymakers, private sector, um, philanthropists, youth organizations, um, you know, indigenous communities, BIPOC, rural, rural communities. So, like, what, what are, what's the type of knowledge that comes when you are, when it's, you, you take seriously, and we're really sort of in conversation and collaboration with this broader, um, this, this broader um, group of science scholars as well as um, sort of non, non academics. Um, and so, I really want to emphasize that because, you know, based on what my, my, my last comment, I'm not saying that we don't need that 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 the, the biophysical dimensions the technology the economics is it unimportant they're incredibly important i'm just what i'm saying is that those areas have and those disciplines have largely led um it, it's been the north star and right now we need a sort of a, a a north star that's that's based on sort of equity and justice and when you do that and you bring the sort of the, the natural scientists and the, the, the social scientists and the humanities together. And, and we bring our, our, you know, look, sort of all of our, you know, and we're collaborating um, with the, our, our kind of our, our, our non academic partners. Like you end up with a very different set of, um, you, you end up with a very different, um, you know, set of, of research, research questions. Um, but, but in terms of the narrative uh, um, issue, let me, I'm just kind of going back to it too. Um, so what do you see as valuable uh, for changing the narrative? It, it pop yeah, I mean, it, it, exactly. And I think that, you know, the, the importance of collective action, the work of Eleanor o Ostrom, who was a political scientist uh, who won the Nobel Prize, in, but won the Nobel Pri Prize in economics, um, you know, she based her work and he, she based her work on collective action on, um, you know, reviewing thousands of case studies from anthropology of, of examples of, of uh, um, community, community based and, and um, common property management systems. And so she herself was sort of really bringing together this, uh, 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 you know, a, 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 a true like interdisciplinary scholar. Um, but, but I, but I think that you know, from the humanities and the social sciences, like, you know, these narratives are, are not new, but they've not, they certainly have not necessarily um, been at the forefront of, of a lot of the climate science. So um, I, I, so I do think it's, it's, it's important, you know, I think we do want to move away from individual actions because individual actions as we, as we now know will be insufficient for solving. And, and, and I feel like in the, when, when, when we think about individual action as being, um, you know, our main uh, avenue for climate action, that is disempowering. I feel like that is disempowering. But when you think about collective action, and you know, and I think that climate justice really lends itself to that because it's not just a discourse or a field; it's a social movement, and that by itself, as a social movement, it is a a, a type of collective action, and we've seen. You know, youth and and various various groups are like a large, you know, like just just really coming together around around some of this. So I do think that those narratives are, are critically important, and that is more possible because of this type of convergence 
um, ecosystem that we that we we hope to support uh, through some of the work of the center. Thanks, Dr. Osborne. We have a, another question from uh, Dr. Andy Miller, who is asking about the UN report highlighting the need to reduce methane emissions quickly as a critical component of climate strategy. And so the question is, where does controlling methane emissions fit within the climate justice playbook? Well, I mean, the, it's about all greenhouse gas emissions. I'm not just talking about carbon. Um, it's about all greenhouse gas emissions and it, because methane obviously has a very high global warming potential. It's clearly an area and obviously in the areas of, you know, it definitely sort of feed, feeds into sort of areas of like natural natural um, climate solutions as well as the, ju the just transition. Like how do we change and shift some of our agricultural practices so that we significantly reduce methane? How do we, you know, what, what are some of the, um, um, changes, uh, um, you know, that that we might use technological changes that we might use to sort of um, reduce emissions in in landfills. And so, um, but I do think that, yeah, yeah I mean, methane is certainly a, a key, you know, we have to we have to consider all of our, our greenhouse gas emissions, but not necessarily as sort of isolated. Oh, let's just pay attention to methane, but like really systemically, how is it when we change our agricultural practices? that not only carbon is reduced and stored more in the soils, but how is like, you know, how is methane also reduced? How are the other green, how, how is nitrous, nitrous oxide reduced? How is like, how are all of the greenhouse gases um, reduced when we have these sort of more fundamental, um, you know, uh, transformations in our, our uh, product, these productive um, sectors? Thank you. Can, can I follow up on, since we're on emissions, uh, one of the other questions that I wanted to ask was about kind of some of your first couple of slides, um, you know, looking at the historical emissions and the responsibility vulnerability of emissions uh, that you put up. Um, we see that emissions are very much entangled with imperialism and the playbook seems to fight toward dismantling the kinds of structures that have supported those unequal uh the emissions and vulnerability so my question is how can the playbook be used as a platform for broader justice outside of uh climate or emissions yeah well i think that's sort of why it's focused on climate justice as opposed to climate action because as as, as i i mentioned you know climate justice is about connecting the dots between the climate crisis and a range of other social, racial, and environmental crises. So, you know, um, you know, at various scales. So that might play out in you know a city. That might play out in within a country, and and also between relationships of countries. So, um, I would say that uh, that that's exactly you know. That that's exactly why we this this framing of climate justice is so in, uh, important. That it's not only about emissions; it's about sort of these deeper these deep, deeper um, um, sort of structural um, changes, transformations that um, that that operate on various scales. So so for example, like those maps that that I, I showed in the beginning shows sort of the in, the, the kind of the global inequities. Um, and, you know, in a lot of ways, climate justice, like some of the, the, the initial um, um, sort of arguments or, uh, for the need for climate justice really came at the international level with countries that were concerned about developing countries that were concerned about, you know, how much of the, the, the carbon budget had already been used by industrial countries and whether or not they would be able to continue to develop their economies. So there was a lot of discussion about historical emissions and historical responsibility. Uh, and and you know uh, and so that that climate justice uh, discussion, in a lot of ways, I would say it, it really it it, start, it might have it started there. You know, I mean, there was a lot of discussion at the international level, and we've now we've seen now how it also speaks to issues of you know the the, the kind of example that I I shared about um, places like Richmond, you know, on, on in the in in the Bay Area areas that are heavily um, you know, I impacted by the petrochemical industry and, and impact and those who are largely impacted are 
you know, communities of color, poor communities and communities of color in the, in the area. And so now we see how um, climate justice speaks to a whole set of injustices, both those that are uh, that are um, kind of international based on these kind of um, imperial or like, you know, sort of colonial relationships, as well as those that are based on a long legacy of racism in places like the, the United States and elsewhere, um, as well as, you know, the environmental justice issues, as well as, um, you know, the, the fact that there are certain um, forms of development that are aligned with a type of, you know, economic growth um, logic and, and market logic that has often been supported through policies at the expense of other forms of, uh, of development that, that actually have much lower emissions. Thanks so much, Dr. Osborne. Uh, we've been peppering you with questions. So if you're if you're game for a couple more, there are about two more, and one of which I want to piggyback on, if I might. Um, but uh, uh, Bambi Chapin uh, asks, one of the ways I understood you to be talking um, uh, understood you to be talking about university leadership on climate justice is to take big steps in rectifying our own climate impacts. Um, and understanding that this is a question more for our own campus community, and I would definitely welcome more of a discussion and open discussion about that. Um, do you have suggestions for us? And I'll, I'll listen to your answer and I might have a follow up on that too, with some specifics about um, recommendations that might come out of your center as it, uh, as it emerges now. But uh, first for uh, Dr. Chapin's question, yeah. What are your recommendations for a university campus? Yeah, well, um, the University of California has certainly, um, I would say, been a leader on climate action. They, you know, certainly through the carbon neutrality goal of, um, you know, uh, in 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 twenty it laid out in twenty fifteen um, to to um, become carbon neutral across all ten campuses by the year 2025. And actually my campus, UC Merced, we've already uh, reached that goal, mainly because we're the newest campus. And so we have had a lot of LEED certified buildings. Um, you know, the it, that the ways of getting there are, are certainly sort of, you know, retrofits, energy efficiency, renewable energy, um, but also carbon offsets. So there are, we've, we've also invested in, in, in carbon F offsets. I would say that the UC, has recognized some of the problems with carbon offsets. So they've asked faculty and researchers across the UC to de help develop projects that will have sort of more um, positive uh, outcomes on the ground. And so, um, so, so but, I, but I also would say that the UC more recently um, has signed the um, cli climate emergency um, climate climate emergency mobilization um you know uh, uh, um document um they they they've signed up they've signed up and they're supportive of the climate emergency mobilization they've also uh last year actually became become um fossil free and so they they've been di di divested and that's actually you know a sort of definitely a, a more radical move and i think that those are some of the ways in which um you know, and they, 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 there's been a progression. I think there's also a recognition of the importance of climate justice and it, across the UC. And we really hope to support um, the, the University of, 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 Cal, of California in um, really understanding and, and implementing and su supporting them in that, uh, in that, um, uh, in their progress toward uh, um, and strategies for, for climate justice. So what would that mean? Um, I mean, I do think that it is sort of concretely, I do think that um, the type of divestment is, a, is was, and these are, you know, in a lot of ways, what do we do? Like, let's listen to our students because the students were the ones who first said, we want to be carbon neutral because that was the, the most, that was the information that we had at the time in, in 20, 2015. And that was a, a really good move um, because it allowed us to sort of start investing in renewable energy and energy efficiency. So we listened to our students again when they demanded that we become fossil free. 
And so I say, and now they're demanding that we pay attention to climate justice. So I would say, you know, let's just continue listening to them and following their lead. This is their generation, that it's their generation that are, are, are going to be impacted longest from this. Um, so we have a, a responsibility. Um, and I would say also that it's really critical that we work in an interdisciplinary way as scholars. Currently around the climate issue, the, the natural, science, natural science and sort of economics and engineering have really dominated on climate. And those are really important fields. Um, I have a, a master's degree in economics. I'm trained as an interdisciplinary scholar. Um, but I, um, I really recognize, and I'm in an engineering school right now, um, but but the point is is that I recognize the importance of all of our all of these fields and all of this knowledge. Um, but I think that traditionally the fields that have tended to be apolitical have really dominated this. And so we really need to bring not only an interdisciplinary group of scholars together, but we really need to bring to the table the the the, the community organizations, the policymakers, the activists, the the um the private sector actors who are committed to climate justice like we need a, a sort of a, a to have a broader tent um because this is an issue that it's not it's not an academic question it's um it's it's not purely an academic question it's a, it's a, it's a participatory research action question it's an applied research question um and certainly there are um ways in which we can move our scholarship forward um, we, we, we're, we're contributing to the literature through this, this work, but I think in order to determine like what it is that we want to put not only our energy to toward, but also the energy of our students, they are hungry for this type of work. I, and I know that because a lot of the students that have come to work with me, they're interested in, in this type of, this type of work. Um, they're interested in a type of like public political ecology, like an, an engaged engaged scholarship and 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 you know these are students who are have have both the social science background who also have like more of a natural science background but i i think that we need this this kind of um to to really um yeah this interdisciplinarity transdisciplinarity convergence research i think really has to be at the heart of some of this work Thank you so much for that answer. And thanks to Dr. Chapin for asking the question. I kind of, I'm glad we're recording. I kind of want to like press repeat on like <laughs> that segment, especially of your answer just over and over again. Um, it, it speaks to a lot of things that we've been thinking about here at UMBC and in Maryland. Um, and I'm just going to take a moment to say that in this year's legislative session, which at, uh, ended rather sadly just a couple of weeks ago, we had a bill, as you say, um, developed by a student group that um, was going to, one, move up the timeline of reaching carbon neutrality for the University of Maryland system, uh, and it hoped to um, shift our offsets. So we, I, I think UMBC is not quite yet relying on offsets, but in a couple of years, that's where we're supposed to be going. Mm -hmm. And the, the idea was to just exactly as you say, um, make sure that those offsets are, um, are things that are local mm -hmm. and are a result or are coming out of studies that are done um, in conjunction between our campuses and uh, communities, particularly um, communities that are facing climate justice and environmental justice struggles. Mm -hmm. So um, everything you just said actually fits really well with this bill and the bill failed. Mm -hmm. um, so for those of you who are here and haven't, hadn't been following that bill, it's something that students developed and proposed and one of our faculty members, um, uh, Dr. Holland, um, spoke uh, in support of that bill and it just didn't it didn't go any farther uh, in the legislature this year um, so that's a really important step though and i'm guessing this will be reintroduced next year and i would love to have kind of an ongoing dialogue with you and your center about um, how important this has been for um, folks on the other coast because um, i feel like uh, out here uh, in Maryland, we can learn from what you're doing. Um, 
Yeah. Okay, we'll see, see what's, what's happened. We'd be happy to continue the conversation. And, awesome. and yeah, we'd be happy to be happy to support. Awesome. And, and Dr. Chapin, yes, let's continue having this conversation on our campus too, as we are also staying in dialogue with Dr. Osborne. Um, if you're up for it, I think we have one more question. Sure, go for it. Right. Um, so this is from Emma Gilligan. Um, given the slow movement and large impact of federal initiatives, what would you most like to see from the federal government in placing climate justice more toward the forefront of informing federal environmental work? Well, I would have to say that, I mean, compared to any government in U.S. sort of administration in the last, you know, decades. I mean, this is, you know, the 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 types of proposals that are are on the table through this administration, the current administration, the Biden Harris administration is um, is actually quite, uh, you know, it's it's quite it's exciting. You know, I mean, it's it's um, a, a, it's more sort of forward thinking. It's taking into consideration. Um, equity and justice in a way that we have not seen before. So, I would say, um, what would I most like to see from the federal government? I would like to see, um, you know, you know, just, I mean, moving, moving in, in the direction and moving in the direction even, even faster. Um, I would like to see, um, you know, I would like to see sort of um, you know, support for for young people even coming out of college as a, a as part of a, a type of like climate justice core, you know, to have an op opportunities to participate in this transformation that that is is laid out in some of um, the the proposals and, and policies. Um, so, I mean, honestly, I mean, compared to what we have seen in the last few decades. This is actually a, a quite um, impressive um, um, set of policies that are being that are being promoted, and that is not by accident. It's also because of the you know of of the youth movement, and it's about but because of the climate justice movement that have been um, you know really sort of discussing these issues and really making them uh, um, you know making them a, an important sort of political political issue. For for decades, this is all of the frontline communities that have been working on these 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 ideas and issues for for decades. Now means that we're in a place where the federal government is sort of adopting policies that are a lot more aligned with climate justice than we've seen in the past. Is it perfect? No, it is not perfect. I mean, there certainly are flaws, um, but nonetheless, I think we are moving in the right direction, and I'd like to see a lot more of that. Thank you so much, Dr. Tracy Osborne. That was such a fantastic talk. Uh, um, and so special thanks to the, the Center for Social Science Scholarship uh, for hosting you. And I pasted links in the chat to the uh, UC Center for Climate Justice uh, so that hopefully we can find out, learn more about the MOOC uh, as, it's, as it's created. Um, uh, so, and I'll just plug really quickly tomorrow. We also have Dr. Ruth Wilson Gilmore talking, uh, making abolition geographies, social justice organizing for vulnerable households, workers, and communities hosted by the Drescher Center for Humanities, as well as several of the departments on campus. Um, and with that, thank you so much, Dr. Tracy Osborne. Thanks everyone.